What's up, y'all? This is Doug E. Fresh, and you're watching We Talk Weekly. You're listening to We Talk Weekly right here. All right. So we're going to go right into the sizzle, and then we're going to have David also sizzle. Holler at me early. <laughs> All right, so um, comedian Michael Blackson, he's inked a deal with Celebrity Boxing, and he's not wasting any time, okay? So after officially signing his contract with our friend Celebrity Boxing founder, CEO Damon Feldman, right. Michael guy. Blackson, yeah, shout out to him. Shout out to him. We got to get him back here in the studio. Um, but um, Michael Blackson started calling out several comedians by name that he wants to fight. Michael Blackson <laughs> called out Kevin Hart. I'm sorry. Cat Williams, <laughs> you, you e. Ray Davis. Sucker. You mother sucker. <laughs> and D, D, DC Young Fly. DC Young Fly. So you know okay. Kevin Hart and Michael Blackson, they have a history which dates back to. Yeah. They feel uh, funny though. Yeah, it's like, come on. come on now. But like <laughs> Michael Blackson had his comedy jokes he made about Kevin Hart's cheating scandal that played out in 2017 when his wife was eight months pregnant. Yeah. Well, Mike and Mike and Kevin had uh, hashed out their differences in 2018 at the 76ers playoff game. Yeah. But it looks like the beef is back on. So, yeah. like, I, I would be curious to see if, you know, what's, what's going to go on with that. Mm -hmm. um, Dwight Howard, he has denied allegations in a civil lawsuit filed by a man in Georgia who has accused him and another individual of sexual assault, battery, false imprisonment, and emotional dis distress. So S Stephen Harper alleges he met Dwight on Instagram, and he met. Then he went to Dwight's house. Long story short, Stephen was on his way, and Dwight Howard texted him and asked him if he wanted to partake in a third party, mm -hmm. join in their little arrangement. Um, Stephen just declined, but when he got to the house. Um, he was just surprised by this man that was identified as Kitty who walked out and Stefan said at that point he was forced into this encounter with both Dwight and Kitty. What? So Dwight is denying those allegations. Well, Mace, he chimed in on his talk show. Uh, it is what it is. Um, Mace offered his opinion saying we have to stop telling people we don't care what they do on their own time because we do care what they do. May said they tell we tell people it doesn't matter, but behind your back it does matter. He said there's 30 teams out there that did not sign Dwight Howard because it matters. May said it's never consensual if you surprise somebody. Mace also used the example that if you're with somebody alone and somebody walks out of a side door with a leprechaun outfit on, it's no longer consensual. He said, "You if, if it's not decided on beforehand, then it's just not consensual. Right. But Dwight Howard, he kind of spoke out saying that whatever goes on in his bedroom is none of anybody's business. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, just that one, that's, that's a tough one. Interesting, right yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, the celebrity sizzle goes to Rock Nation. And it's no question you ain't that Jay Trump, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's no question that that, uh, talk, that Jay Z has had an amazing career as an artist, including most number one albums, fourteen of any solo album on the Billboard 200, first rapper inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, yeah. and so much more. Well, Brock Nation created this exhibit. And per the library's website, Br Brooklyn Public Library is pleased to present the Book of Hove, an installation created by Rock Nation to celebrate the life and work of Sean Jay-Z Carter. The Book of Hove features not, never, never be before seen images, art, and ephemera from the artist's archives, providing an unparalleled look at an extra or extraordinary life and career. So this is free. You don't need a library card, and there's no admission fee. Um, check out the interview that he did with Gail King, which was dope. Um, he And then he officially answered the question, uh, what should you do? Should you take the $500,000 cash or lunch with Jay-Z? He said, take the cash and buy those albums. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah, that's so right. <laughs> the exhibit ends December 4th on Jay-Z's birth birthday. So I'm going to try and go and see it. Um, it sounds like it's going to be awesome. Take your kids. That's funny. Yeah. That's funny. All right, I'm that your girl, little, Lauren yeah. Sizzle. And that was the sizzle. And that was the sizzle, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody <laughs> was talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Rick I, was like, I, take the... the uh, Rick was like, take the interview. You talk yeah, take, to him. Yeah, that, I'll he, take the yeah. interview. Yeah. Yeah. I, you would That's take the a, interview? I would definitely take the interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm taking the I would take the lunch. <laughs> listen to every album, because he already gave you all the game in every album. Yeah, and every, he already gave yeah, you the gave game. You the I already game. have all the I already have all the albums. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking the cash. But what I don't have is answers to questions that I have. No, no, I got you. I got you. Well, you can't buy that. You can't buy that, so yeah, take 
take the I got all the albums in the house. So <laughs> exactly. I, I, you can give me the cash. I'll be all right. I'm going to flip that. You know what I'm I saying? met him a couple of times. So I feel a little different. <laughs> give, me <the> <laughs> give me the cash. Give me the cash. What's up? <laughs> and speaking of art, you know, I have someone with whom I have a tremendous amount of respect for who has always been in support of the art scene. Thank who you. Who has always been in support of the artists, people within arts and culture, and always been visible and around. Without further ado, someone with whom I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Mr. David. Oh, how are you, my friend? I am doing very well. Thank you very much. All right. So I want to thank you for coming to the show. Um, you've been here a few times. You know, yeah. You, yeah. you're like a friend to the show already. Oh, so thank you very much. Absolutely. And so we appreciate you yep. for uh, for coming again. And um, it looks like, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, the, the y'all at the finish line. Yes. You, your campaign, your campaigning is, you know, you see the finish line. Y'all running neck and neck. And, you know, how does it feel to finally, I guess, be somewhere where you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and and um i have to ask you you know uh have you felt the support from the republican party in support of you you know well um they certainly haven't been against me right uh, so that's good news yeah, yeah uh, and, sure. they, and they try to be helpful to some extent right but i think you know the republican party being uh, such a minority party for so many years uh, and unfortunately, because I, I, I believe in a two-party system, I think right. it's good to have checks and balances. But, um, you know, the Republican Party is very weak in this city. Uh, sorry to say that, but that's the truth. Yeah. And, you know, they have very particular agendas. And I think, you know, their focus pretty much is on the council races. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm someone who left council. I had yeah. served my time there. And uh, I didn't really uh, see a reason for me to do another four years. And I, I certainly see a reason why we should open up for other people to give it a shot. So, um, you know, the Republican Party has been, um, you know, uh, certainly trying to be helpful in the ways that they are. Right, right, right. How do you feel about your campaign as of the date to date? You know, do you feel like you're in a good standing with everyone? Do you feel like you're gaining momentum? How do you feel now? Well, I feel good. I mean, I think the race uh, was, for the most part, predictable, okay. except for one huge element, and that is Parker not campaigning after May 16th, hmm. which was completely uh, something no one could predict. And I can't think of a good reason why that would happen, right. but it's not for me to think about other than uh, it would have been better, I think, for the public if the two candidates went to each councilmatic district, uh, had open debates and forums, right. and really let people kick the tires, ask their questions, make their criticisms. Because in all of that, including the venting, right. there is an engagement of the public that gives them hope that government is going to be listening, a big thing that people complain about the government has got no ears for us yeah. does not hear what we're talking about does not respond and they see it more and more every year in other words a school district that doesn't accommodate parents a school district that doesn't take care of the children a city hall that's never open for them uh you know services they can't get you know all, we've been through yeah. it all right um so so i do think that it would have been wonderful to have like a summer and a fall of just engaging the public and and being really transparent about it and and uh well but that did not happen mm -hmm. and so um and i didn't think it was going to happen to be honest i just thought it would be wonderful if we could do that yeah. but i did expect us to have at least one or two televised debates and and at least appear at the same time at this you know, on the same stage and have some forums and discussions much more than 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 was done um but on my part you know uh it's actually you know uh advantageous for me yeah so i was out uh, all summer uh, multiple times a day meeting people going to events yeah, you were busy yeah mm -hmm. and oftentimes because they were anticipating two candidates but only one showed up mm -hmm. and so that just made things much more simpler for me right. but at the same time without two candidates there are not a lot of interest and so many so many events that people were planning just never happened because they couldn't get two candidates and without two candidates they weren't interested yeah i was wondering, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was wondering that too because yeah. um you know during when everybody's threw their hat in the ring yeah. and you kept seeing the the debates and just 
everybody was going here, did here, there, different venues and all that, and the debates were happening, and so many people were engaged. And then it was like once you know it was decided the 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 primary the primary democratic primary. Then there was nothing. Mm-hmm. So now it's like this period where it's so quiet and people are like not even remembering that election is what a week and a half away. Yeah, yeah. November seventh. Like, yeah. Right. And why didn't we have those debates? Why didn't we have like the same? Like I I was wanting to see that. Like just the two of you. Um, debating, well, like I, we saw during the yeah, the I'll, I'll just I'll just say frankly that uh, I was looking forward to the debates and the discussions, and really on the issues. And um, you know, so I was contacted pretty early on by six ABC and CBS three and and uh, a lot of different uh, organization, nonprofit, civic group, newspapers, trying to get um, a, a date and a time. And I just basically said every time. Uh, whenever uh, I, I'm in, whatever it is, wherever it is, whatever time it is, and if there are multiple dates, you could just uh, check with Parker, and whatever's good for her is good for me. Uh, but she was not agreeing to any of the debates, any of the forums, until finally she agreed to one. But it required that we show up at separate times, enter separate doors, and wait in separate uh, waiting rooms, and then we would appear separately. Like one of us would go first, someone would go second. And um, that's the first one that she agreed to, and the other ones are kind of like that. And then there was a newspaper article mm. about is she ducking or uh, avoiding, you know, the uh, debates and the <coughs> forums. And she agreed to uh, the KYW right. radio debate, which was not really quite a debate. And before that, she agreed to um, Channel 6's televised kind of interview, which I thought was very helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, can I jump in? Um, they, um, sure. Uh, David and asked, like, kind of, isn't it, though, the same philosophy as uh, Trump, who is also a Republican, and how he has decided that I don't need to do the debates, right? Because he yeah. is the he's a prominent Republican in the race, right? And there's really no odds against him. That's going to any debate is really going to change that. He has 50 percent or more of the support, and in the, and in in a Democratic city where you have a Democratic mayor and there's 80 uh, percent of the you know prominence, would you, if you were in her position, then be open to the base that would seemingly like Trump has decided unnecessary? Well, I I, I don't really, um, I wouldn't agree with Trump. In other words, if you think you're going to win, that's fine, but why don't you get out in front of the people? Hmm. And by the way, nothing is guaranteed, not for Trump or anyone else, but this is not the same situation. In other words, um, in this city, though it be a seven to one to one city, on election day, it's four to one to one. And I am known for getting over 25% of the Democratic vote. And so we go into a three to three situation pretty quickly. And uh, to not get out and campaign, you're really risking losing. And I'm just going to say the momentum is with me. Uh, I, am, uh, g- I am gaining, and she is uh, declining in the votes. So I see it as a close race. It's a toss up, far as I can tell. You never know on election day because it can be wildly different yeah. than whatever the trajectories are. But, um, you know, she didn't start with a lot of votes to begin with. She was a state rep um, and then a uh, district council person. Her maximum votes uh, were like 29,000. The largest amount of votes she ever got was 81,000 during the Democratic primary. And I've had 11 years of going to every nook and cranny of this city. Mm. I have been um, to every section. I know the people. I have uh, done different things with them. Uh, I don't take the summer off. I hardly take a holiday off. I generally, you know, I just don't even do the the, the weekends. So I work straight through, and I do my own initiatives because I don't get any money from the city, and I'm often battling, what, the city government. And so many times I'm taking up the causes of people who have no champion. Um, So I would say if I were, you know, advising uh, her, I would say you really can't take that strategy in the city with David O because – um, he is used to fighting the Democratic Party, Republican Party, and most yeah. of the unions and everybody else. So, so I'm always underfunded, like mm-hmm. five to one, this time ten to one. But, you know, this is new territory for Parker. Uh, she has not had to go into a general election with a competitive race in a competitive race. And I'm not saying she isn't going to win. I'm just saying... This is new territory. This is a, a person who has ba- basically had no opponent. And uh, one in May, uh, she had opponents in this primary, you know, was the winner. 
but why not just keep campaigning until November 7th? Because if you are sure you're going to win, then it's no longer about the win. It's about the unification of people mm -hmm. and securing the win. Yeah. But yep. in my opinion, um, since you're asking, I would yeah. say uh, I got the momentum and people forget real quick, like who was the candidate because they've not seen her. Uh, and that raises a question, like if she's the winner and they're ready to celebrate, she's nowhere around, th then why did that happen? And and I've seen it on the, you know, when I go to community meetings and civic groups, where is our candidate um, and how come they're not here? And, you know, the thing people wonder is, are you just assuming you're going to win with our vote, like our vote doesn't count? And I would look at it this way, and I, I'm very critical of it because I basically see myself as a reformer. You know, I was never really a part of any political organization, machine, or whatnot. Um, at the point in time where elected officials don't feel like they need the voters, what they need is a political machine. The machine gets you in. As long as you have the machine, you're going to win. Or if you have the right registration or anything like that. But I think that's a, a sign that someone or some people or a group of people have just been too entrenched and are just way too comfortable mm. because they no longer uh, really hear the people. And I think the machine, and when I say machine, I, just, I don't just mean like political organization or groups. I mean all that is attached to them. They're very, very, very removed from the people. Um, and that's why I feel, for example, when I do bills to stop the uh, property taxes and I say they are improper and they are yeah. really hurting people, how come they're voted against? You know, well, whoever's voting against them must not feel like there's any repercussions, you know, about trying to get the parking authority back. Almost everybody in the city would say that's a good thing to do. We're not taking the whole thing back. We just need a cooper cooperation agreement so we know where the money is and we can fund the schools, probably $50 million a year, instead of raising people's property taxes, instead of doing a soda tax. But when I'm soundly defeated by my council colleagues, including Parker, um, then what does that say? Because what, you're not accountable to the people or you think they don't know or they don't care? And, you know, now that we're all talking about drones, I did that in 2016 and mm -hmm. had nothing but opposition. Mm -hmm. really? it's, it's, oh, sure. Yeah. So now people are talking about drones, but why? Because they really believe in it or because it's a catchy thing to say right now? In other words, wasn't Parker the one who did a referendum against stop and frisk, like really put it on the charter, said the people need a voice, and they all said they don't want it. And now she's saying she's going to bring it back plus the National Guard. I mean, is that about changing her position or is that about pandering to whatever poll she's reading out there? And I, I just say it's very dangerous to follow polls. Yeah, the, the polls I've seen, you know what they say? They say like 52%, and I'm not saying they're accurate. Right. I've saw, seen the poll. 52% of people in Philadelphia want the return of stop and frisk. It's very popular to talk about the National Guard. Yeah, that may be true in a poll, but I doubt, I will say I doubt that is accurate with the voters, with the communities, or anything. Because it's in a very isolated way. You could say, would you prefer this? They could say, yeah, but when you bring it to reality, they don't want it. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, you, you said a lot, but that, that particular thing, and she was clear that her position is Terry stops, not necessarily stop. Same it. thing. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, you yeah. could play semantics. Yeah, I'll, I'll you. just clarify because I'm an attorney, <laughs> and, I'm a, a, and I am I'm, a. I just, uh, just, well, tell us, just tell by, us the difference. Yeah, but yeah, just by way, I just stop. wanted yeah. to clear because she just was on the show and this. Yeah, she, she I made know. It clear, that, yeah, it's so. the exact same thing. There, so there's a case. There's a case that went to the Supreme Court called Terry versus Ohio, which laid out the standard by which you can do stop and frisk. It's the same thing. Terry stop, right. stop and frisk. So no difference, same case. And what the court said is you need two elements, right? Because typically what people will understand is police cannot search you. That You have a constitutional right against unreasonable, unlawful searches. Right. So why is stop and frisk not a, a violation of the Constitution? Well, they don't have probable cause. That's the main thing. If right, I see you right. do something, I'm thinking you might be doing something, I can't stop and search you. Why? I don't have probable cause. I can't just, like, guess you might be doing something. Now, I could stop you to investigate, but you could walk right by me. Mm -hmm. I can't put my hands on you, right? You have no proof, no evidence. Right. So the only exception is if you're possibly 
based on articulable facts, armed and dangerous. So for a police officer, for example, who receives information that you're involved in a crime and that you're armed and dangerous, you may not be, but I can point to actual facts that I receive that tells me when I stop you, I can frisk you, pat you down on your outer clothing, specifically to make, make sure that a weapon is not in, within your reach. And that's right. the limit of it. You can't do more than that. But when you send out police, let's say from Northeast Philly to Malcolm X Park, and you say, make sure no one's hanging around the park because we don't want them shooting each other. Mm. Uh, and then you go up to young Gosh, black I men, know what young black about. men, right? Jeez. And you say like, go home and they say no. Yeah. And you say, come here, let me let Just me start, check you yeah, out, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. not gonna recover anything, yeah. right? You're not gonna, because there was, there was nothing you saw or heard it's just a harassing way of flexing muscle mm -hmm. on you. But you know what? You have a constitutional right not to leave the park. Everybody may want you to, but you're not violating laws just staying out there. You're an adult. You're hanging out in the park. You're not doing anything wrong. That's what it's for, right? Right, right. So when the police come and say, like, okay, you're not doing what I want, so now I'm going to make you stand up, spread your legs, I'm going to search you, I'm going to go in your pockets – now they are violating the law. And what I'm saying is, given the history of this city, given the fact that you know what's going to happen, given yeah. the fact that you, wow. the police don't understand what you're saying. When you as the mayor say, go stop and frisk people, they think they have a legal right to do what they're doing. And I've talked to many police officers who do not know what the legal standard is in stop and frisk. And I was going to, and I was going to ask about that because uh, one thing it, in her defense, yep. she 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 talked about making sure that they were knowledgeable enough to make you know cognizant choices, right? But yeah, I, it sounds I, like everybody needs to be educated yeah, on both sides, exactly on both sides. But you know, for me, it's kind of one of those things that if you know a, a cop might be having a bad day, it's up to his or under his interpretation to decide. Well, what's you know, constitutional or not, right? They have and to. You, they have to. It's also PTSD. Jump with it. Right, right. Thirty-five and up for people who have dealt with the stop and frisk right. and having that time. You know that during living that time of when you would be walking down the street. Now, also, what about those who are licensed to carry yeah. and you do have a weapon on you? Absolutely. Then you, that that even opens up another door. It does, and and just to kind of put a layer on that, you have a lot of you know cops that have no communication. Like you, and and I hate because it always sounds like I'm in support of you, but I don't want to say that I'm a support of people who I have seen in the community meeting the people right right and so i see you in a community meeting the people and so you might be able to talk to a gentleman who may you know to someone else to a police look intimidating right so they'll make a decision based on this person looks intimidating right, right. go ahead Spartan. but what i was going to say is what Sherelle Parker spoke about, let's talk about the victims now. Right. Let's talk about, like, as right. a mom, I'm the person who, if you in the car and you, what is it, boxing with this, whatever, yeah. I'm going to be, like, knocking on the window, like, what are you doing in my neighborhood? You don't live right, around right, right. here. So what do we do? If we're not going to have a stop and frisk, we're not, to or Terry Correct. stops, then, David O, tell us what is the plan of making the crime rate decrease in the city of Philadelphia? Okay, okay. so, so. Yeah, so you can make the crime rate decrease, and you don't need to violate anybody's rights. Right. First of all, when you actually have facts that lead you to believe reasonably someone's armed and dangerous, you have every right as an officer for your own safety to right. pat them down. Nobody's saying you can't. The problem is when people ask a mayoral candidate, how will you stop crime in southwest Philly? Oh, I'm going to do stop and frisk. Okay, real bad idea. It, first of all, you're going to alienate the community. You're vilifying the police. I guarantee you, you will have problems mm -hmm. because you cannot use that tool that way. The best thing you could do is to educate the police. Listen, if you have reasonable suspicion based on facts, someone is armed and dangerous in the process of committing a crime, to protect yourself, you can pat them down. Outside right. of that, you cannot. That's why we don't use it as a technique. Now, what I will say is there's many ways that you can deal with the criminality and particularly the gun violence that we have. One is we have technology that can identify who's carrying a weapon. 
hmm. and we can use that right now what we can't tell is you may have a legal weapon got you, right no, we're not you, we're yeah. not saying just because you have a weapon you're doing anything wrong but at least now we're alert and part of that is we have to um calm down our officers we have to train them and again i did a a, a a resolution on mandatory minimum force training for police because this is a standard type of thing you do you don't only train police to shoot people you train them not to shoot people mm -hmm. to use their judgment they do it in the military yeah. it's not a bizarre thing but again, my uh, resolution for mandatory minimum force training was defeated in council and uh, Parker tabled it. I don't get it. I don't get it because you have been one of the most uh, progressive uh, council people who have been putting in, you know, uh, legislation or trying to put in legislation to, you know, come up with solutions, you know, to fix some of the issues that we have. But they, they keep getting tabled. Right. Why, why is that? Why do you believe that is? Well, this is this is what I think. And, and uh, you know, people could fill in whatever they want from there. Um, there is a organization, like a baseball team. Right. And this team is a team. They don't always agree with each other, but they, they, they are the team and, and they have this uh, group. And even if they oppose each other, they, they believe in the value of this team because it's the team that gets the money, that, that picks the people, that decides who the players are. And sometimes, or many times, the people on this team feel that the management of this team is actually not doing a good job. Yeah. Um, and, and so really the challenge is where do the independent minds, the independent thinkers, the innovative thinkers come into play when they are got so much pressure from this organization to no not go out outside of the bounds. Let me give an example, and it's a little long, but I I, I think it's a good one that I can explain things about. Okay. If there is a pothole, it costs a hundred dollars to fill the pothole for five years, but in politics, uh, that pothole is a way to get people paid. So someone who is supporting a politician will get the contract for that pothole, but. They don't want a hundred bucks for five years, so they don't fill it so good, and it only lasts for a year. And now, instead of a hundred bucks for five years, <laughs> you get five hundred bucks for five years, right? So, <laughs> corporate planned right. adolescence. No, so, so what happens is, <laughs> yep, wink, wink, happens. wink. You you cannot do a good job because wow. we want to get you paid. Now, after a while, it's not enough to have five hundred dollars, so that one pothole becomes three potholes. Now you got. $1,500. Yeah. And after another while, why even bother filling it? How about you just give me a bill and I'll pay you? Because really my point as a politician, a corrupt politician, a machine politician, is to get you paid. Because the greater good is you're on the team. Mm -hmm. And you're there to help us get elected, get the vote out. You're there for that. So we're paying you with public service money, and the prob which is okay as long as you're actually filling that pothole and right, doing a good right. job. So now someone gets elected who's an honest person. And they say, you know what? We're paying fifteen hundred dollars, uh, and we're not getting anything. We got this empty. I'm gonna take three hundred dollars and fill those three pot holes and let it last for five years. Well, what I do with the fifteen hundred dollars? Well, I'm gonna keep paying people, and we'll add the three hundred. Now it's eighteen hundred dollars to fill the three pot holes, because people don't want to step on somebody's toe. They don't want to upset an elected official's. Uh, you know, fundraising guy, contract, the party machine, the nonprofit, the for profit. And, but if you look at it, we're the poorest big city in America. We have so many problems where people cannot even pay their property taxes, right. let alone, and they got to pay soda taxes. Mm -hmm. So, how are we going to fix schools, take care of roads, provide social service, mental health, do all the things we're supposed to do according to the law? when we have such an, a bloated and expensive system that is never going to reduce that $1,500 from, from people getting paid. And that's the problem because good people are acquiescing to this whole system, and that's why mm -hmm. it's time for a change. So, if, so, so it seems like a, it's, it's like an uphill battle that you're running on a downward slope. It well, doesn't make sense. I, I mean, how, how do you believe that even if you do, yeah. I guess it will change if you, if you became mayor, do right. you then get the help? Cause now you're part uh, of that team. Oh, I don't need the help. Okay. No, I, I'm against that team. Uh, so, okay. so let me say this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right. so let me say this. <laughs> okay. No, listen. 
Uh, <laughs> for for 30 years, for 30 years, you're, you're swimming upstream. If you want to fight the machine, you're right. swimming up right. Niagara Falls. Good luck. Right. You have right. no chance. But one year out of 30, you're flowing downstream because everybody wants that change. They're sick and tired of it. Right. And now right. the machine is swimming upstream trying to convince people you like the way this is going. You like losing your house. You like the sheriff's sale. You like a, a filthy subway system. You like the police coming out, stopping and frisking you. You like the National Jeez. Guard. No, you don't like it, and you're tr they're trying to convince people you got to like this, and I'm just saying they're swimming upstream. Now, they may win. They may win or they may lose, but the, but the thing is I don't have a hard race. So how do you then, I see you smart, right? Yeah. This, this is my question to him, yep. but how do you then, if, if you become mayor, right? Um, how do you enact um, or put in, you know, play all of the ideas that you have with no support? Yeah, if, you, don't, if, you don't need support. What okay. happens is the mayor right. is a tremendously powerful person in our city and what happens, the mayor single-handedly runs the whole city employee force. So, for example, uh, if I am mayor on November 8th, right. uh, you know, I put together a transition team. I have a police commissioner in mind. I have an L&I commissioner. I have a streets commissioner. I have to go find nine uh, school board members who will agree with what I'm telling them to do. I uh, got you. Right? And there's what you. I'm telling them to do. You will make all schools equitable. You mm. will make the budget transparent. You will stop telling people how to live. That is not your job. You will teach kids how to read, write, and all that on an equal basis, and they will decide what they want to be, who they are, and their parents. Now, you as a school, you serve the parents. You serve the community. You're not boss over them. Right, right. And so get, we'll get rid of that. And now I'm going to have five of you. You're going to pick one-fifth the city, and you're going to go into that one-fifth. You're going to know every school. You're going to hold your meeting with the parents, the community, with the kids, and you're going to represent in the school board meeting what they in particular wow. want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jeez. Um, going back to earlier, I have like a two-part question. So yes. one is a comment, one is a question. Yes. Um, going back to the Terry stop, sir, stop yep. and frisk, well, I haven't heard candidates – pull back the layers like an onion has layers the yes. layers are we're doing this because of crime in the city but philadelphia is the poorest city so we're talking about stop and frisk but we're not saying hey stop and frisk is going to stop well you don't have to do that because we're you, you, we're going to have higher minimum wage we're going to have training courses that are free to prepare you for better jobs like we're not talking about what the the, the byproduct is the crime but where is the layers of why they're doing this this yeah. the crime the sure. crime is because of the poverty first question and then second because i might not get the mic again <laughs> no you could chester residents have become increasingly vocal in their opposition to philadelphia trash burning in their county what are the next steps for that so whichever one you want to answer first well let's let's start with the 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 most obvious and important question is um yeah you know, how do you deal with the the root cause in a uh, effective manner. In other words, we've been talking about root causes for decades, and yet they're never addressed. And the, the, the actual conditions, like the disparity in education, mm -hmm. continues to exist. So, so what I would say is this, you're absolutely correct. But because uh, uh, we cannot have a functioning city if people cannot go to school without fear of getting killed, they can't stand at a bus station, they can't go on a subway system. Like we really have to uh, have, um, number one, show people that our city cares. The fact that the, the police do not respond, they're not there, they're not patrolling, leaves people with the impression that this city just does not care what happens to them. And so the first thing that I would do as mayor, I would make sure that we have visible policing. And I said community policing. That's why I find community policing and stop and frisk to be um, exclusive. You, you, you cannot send a police force in and tell them to start making up reasons to frisk people. Yeah, you may, you may put some people, like put them underground for a little while, but not for long. So, so when the police show up, when they are there, th they not only show a presence of safety, but they will ensure that dumping doesn't happen that uh, that uh, illegal tractor trailers aren't in parked in front of people's houses, that cars aren't going 80 miles an hour through their neighborhoods or 300 uh, dirt bikes and ATVs are roaring, roaring through at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
And when the police arrive, street cleaning arrives. Uh, empty lots are taken care of. But the three biggest things that I would do is, one, I would, I would immediately start with visible um, uh, resources and, and equitable efforts that are visible to students, parents, and others, such as the appointment of school board members, being uh, present, hearing from people to reform education. Secondly, you know, I would bring a vocational career into every school. And thirdly, mm -hmm. I'd put a VET program where people can, young, young people can get a certified and work part-time with pay in some of our best companies as, as part of the VET process that they would get to, to getting certified in their job. Then I would take the libraries and I would change the hours and make them suitable to the community, but they have to be clean and safe. And then the rec centers, uh, they have to have resources. And so we can then start with moving affordable housing into the community, building more units, using skilled labor from our neighborhoods where we have so many capable people that can't get a job because of other issues such as um, you know, like rebuild. It's supposed to have neighborhood labor and it just doesn't. And, and, and that's the politics of it, too much politics. So, so I do believe mm -hmm. that once you start addressing that, once you start um, showing the young people that we're looking out for you, we care about you, we are gonna have to remove dangers. You know, some, some, if, if, if someone's just uh, gonna uh, insist on shooting people and killing people, they have to be given time out. You're going to be removed, yeah. and I hope you think about things and, and kind of redeem your life from where you are, but you're not going to be hurting people. And then we bring in the jobs. And what you said, look, this government spends very little time on, on, on the plus side of the economy. We need to develop the economy. People need to have opportunity. They need to see that what they aspire to be can actually happen. That's why I spend so much time on the arts economy, on yeah. technology, on innovation, on culture, on global trade, because it creates so much opportunity and manufacturing is coming back to the United States. Mm -hmm. But we better bring it back here to Philadelphia where, as in the past, because this is not the theoretical thing, when we had a train manufacturer, we had people with uh, felony records making good money doing high-tech welding. Mm -hmm. And once they got certified in high-tech welding, they could get a job anywhere. And I've also said this, unless we deal with the incarcerated population and returning citizens, if we don't get that number to start going down, because it's 375,000 Philadelphians that have been incarcerated, if I multiply that times every child that they have that no longer has a, has a father in their life, and, and, and a father helping mom, and mom having someone to share the responsibilities, mm -hmm. if we turn that into 400,000 people, if we turn that into 425,000, we will never get past this problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'll, I'll be remiss if I yeah. didn't bring this up because yep. you know we had a conversation before yeah. about you talking about supporting building more prisons. Yes. But then you just said that there's more people going into prisons, right? And so, so, how, so how do we, you know, walk that fine line of, yeah. you know, trying to make sure people don't go into those prisons well, that need to be built. Yeah, because of this, because it's nothing like that. What I would say is this, if you have on average 100 people who need to go to hospital every year, right. and your capacity is 75, you're gonna have a lot of sick people, right. making other people sick and unnecessary illness. If you increase your capacity to 100 people, who gets sick, you will be able to address those sick people. Now, right. if you can increase to 125, you could do preventative health care. You want to get to the point where you're not treating the sickness, you're preventing the sickness. And right now, because of politics, our politicians not wanting to be for mass incarceration, they are letting our capacity be too little. And when that happens, in other words, we don't have the capacity for who the courts, it's not us, it's not right. you and me, right. the courts have heard from a victim, a victim has identified an offender, that person is being held for one reason or another in our county prisons until the day of trial. Now, if we don't have capacity, they're on the streets, oftentimes looking for the victim and the witness, and now these people don't want to report crimes anymore. What we should do is have the capacity but change the nature of how we hold people. In other words, for me, 
I would like to have basically minimum security type facilities so that when someone is a first time offender of a nonviolent crime, they're not stuck in one of our county prisons yeah. with someone with uh, aggravated yeah. assaults and other things, you know, and, and they should not lose their job and they should stay in touch with their family. But when we have this type of uh, facility, I now am contacting the state institutions to say, when you have someone coming down to 18 years or a 20 year sentence, we want them in our, we want them in the county of Philadelphia to begin um, reintegrating them into our city where they are able to move about within the facility, acclimate themselves to technology, meet their kids, talk to their families without having to pay bills. And in the second year, I'm gonna move them into a transitional housing in the community, which is much more smaller setting where they don't have to worry about paying the electric bill, things like that. Like after 18 years, they're not just gonna walk back out You know, 20 years later, give them two years of transition to get back in so they don't end up back into the system. Now, because we don't have capacity, what is happening is our, our, um, our uh, corrections officers, they're quitting. Mm. And because they're quitting, it's becoming more dangerous. And now if I'm like a wow. IT person and you're a, a corrections officer and you're not coming back to work, guess what? They don't let me out either because you have a half the certain number of, of personnel staff. And when you're yeah, under, yeah. like I'm supposed to, my shift is over. I want to go home on Friday. I won't get home till Monday. And guess what? I'm not going to keep that job either. Wow. Yeah. So the mismanagement, like in other words, what I find object objectionable, I understand why people would say, don't buy, build a new prison because you're for mass incarceration. Okay. You can say that, but you're not in charge. Right. I'm running for a position to be in charge and I have to be able to say, I know how you feel, but guess what? Capacity, the lack of capacity is getting people hurt. It's putting juveniles in solitary confinement. We're not moving them. They get no credit while, while they're in our county and in our Philadelphia prison system. We have murders, we have uh, violent attacks because all those people are cooped up in there and they're stressed out and they're locked into their holding cells because what? We don't have enough people. Yeah, you know, we had uh, we had a couple people uh, uh, send uh, correspondence to us saying that's you know the the environment in some of those prisons are horrible i mean from okay. not even having e either air conditioner Listen, or I, even heat i agree and, and the thing of it that i'm going to say is this i agree because i was in the district attorney's office right. i went to the prisons often and the prisons were, believe it or not, in better condition in the 1980s mm -hmm. than they are now. They, they've been sitting there getting old. The technology, well, uh, like air conditioning. Right, right. The systems are, are breaking down. And, and you don't have enough people you to, to, to watch over the. And so when you don't have enough people, it's like. When you have one kid, you could dote on that one kid. Yeah. When you got 12 kids, you, yeah, you, you know, you. guess what? Well, you got timeout rooms, <laughs> yeah. all kind of things going on. We have to have the proper number of people. Because what I'm saying is this. Yeah, we're a prison. But when you're in our custody, you're in our care. Like, we have to have that attitude anymore. I got you. Like, how I, we treat you. I wanted to make sure that you yeah. was able to clear that up. Oh, though, yeah. Because I think as we gave, because uh, Sherelle Parker was yep. here, and we wanted to allow a platform for her to clear up some of the things that sure. have been over there. And that was a big issue right there. Um, one of the things that I do agree that you guys are, are kind of sit, sit on and agree with is uh, trades and, and support and that yeah. piece of it. Sure. Um, she mentioned year-round uh, or enacting year round kind of school, you know, and w w what is your thought around that? And do you believe that's that's a, a, another solution that be that should be put in place for, you know, our, our community, the kids out there? Um, so I, I don't know exactly what she means, so I don't want to put words in her mouth. Understood. What I'll say, what I would do and what I believe based on best practice is this. Every child is different. And in a good education system, you treat each child differently. And, and so for that, not every child needs additional schooling. Some children need additional math. Some children need a, additional music. Some children are very gifted in like, let's say arts and other kids hate right. arts and they love math. That's true. So you're trying to have a system, not one size fits all. And you're not trying to 
push every child through some type of square peg or something. Like what happened in our city once upon a time is someone decided every child should go to college. Well, that was a big mistake because not every child wants to go to college. Some children yeah. are just very gifted in things that have nothing to do with college, and it's unrealistic. They don't have the financial wherewithal. They need to get themselves like settled first, and then they could begin to do uh, – they may go to college later. They may get a master's degree or whatever, but to, to try to force children – so what I'd say is this. When you have kids, and we know who these kids are, who are in uh, – underfunded schools with a lack of the proper curriculum in violation of state law let's take care of that first right. let's make sure every school is um, you know of good quality good facilities good curriculum they all have the same opportunities in art and music and sports and all Let, let's do that first and let's make sure there's vocational career uh, options for them and then let's look at the kids who need summer learning and I don't mean summer school punishment. I mean right. an enjoyable process. Let's make sure we have the devices and the opportunities for them to really grow and, and, and develop themselves. And so, yeah, for kids who are, for example, going to good school, got great parents, they have the wealth, they can go to France, whatever they right. want. They don't need additional schooling. But, but for kids who have nothing in their homes, there should be something enjoyable about schooling. It should be fun and educational, and they may need the opportunity, you can't force them, opportunity to have a little extended tutoring, to have something to do on the weekend, to have something over the summer that is enriching because they want to go there. And you know what? A lot of it has to do with um, technology, um, gaming, that type of thing, which has to be worked in. Like in my day, being that I'm 63, everybody, in my day, you would have a basketball court. But for these kids, yeah. it's not a basketball court. You're going to have to provide, you know, the things that they want to relax and enjoy. And just like in my day, a beautiful basketball court with a fantastic leather basketball, man, we would go crazy, right? But these kids, you give them like the, the games, the consoles, that they will go crazy in there. They'll be having such a good time. But that is a tool for us while they're having fun to teach them something, to explore engineering, to get them to say, hey, listen, didn't you have a good time? Well, well, let's go to math now. <laughs> let's let's do a little uh, geometry. Let's, uh, let's do a little group activity here. Let's clean up the school a little bit. Let's all get together and do some things for the neighborhood. So where is David O at? What is it, November 8th, right? November no, 7th. November 7th. Tuesday, November 7th. November 7th. November 8th is when the work starts. Yeah, that's, that's, that's his day, day one. one. Well, that's right. when we find out what happened, yeah. I think, maybe. <laughs> so where is David O, November, uh, I want you to do both sides. Yeah. So November 8th, your first day as mayor, what do you do? Or November 8th, you find out you didn't make mayor, right. what do you do? So uh, I, I haven't thought past November 7th. Like mm. I just, I don't give it any thought. So what happens is, uh, but I could tell you, you know, obviously if, if I win the election or lose the election, the next mayor is going to be sworn in, in in the beginning of January. Uh, so if I don't win the election, I don't have really much to do but pack up my th things in the office and, mm. and take them home and do that type of thing. And then whatever I'm going to think of, I'm going to think of because I really have no plans. Um, you know what I'll say is I didn't intend to do public service. I ended up doing public service, mm. and I've answered the call. You know, yeah. I just nice. feel like in life, you know, uh, there's things you want to do, and there's things you are called to do, and you mm -hmm. either don't answer the call or yeah. you answer the call, right? right. So I, I believe in God, and I believe that when I stand before God, God will say, hey, I called you. Mm. Did, wow. did you not hear me? And with what you know, I wanted you to do this thing. Like, you know about government. You were in city council. Yeah. You know the good and the bad. And I wanted you, I wanted you to believe in me and fight the system yeah. for me, for all my children. And I don't care, you know, like, whatever was going to happen to you, you had to have faith in me to stand up and do the right thing. So, so listen, uh, you know, if I win, here's the work I do. If I don't win, I do some other work. But I feel also that there's a certain amount that you give to something. Like, mm -hmm. in other words, I wouldn't be a councilman for, like, you know, year after year after year, term after term after term. Right. I just feel like y you serve for what you have to offer. 
And when you don't have, you're not productive, like step away, let mm. someone else in. And I didn't want to leave, um, you know, counsel and just step away when I know certain things and I've tried to do things and I could do it as mayor. Like I just feel me personally, there's a lot of injustice in this city. And mm -hmm. I just look at the people losing their houses and I just think about yeah. those property taxes and those kids getting pulled out by Department of Human Service and those crying moms and all that. And I'm just saying, man, somebody like the mayor, they should clean this stuff up because yeah. they got the power to do it. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for your service. I, I have seen you really working and, and being in those those places, especially as it relates to the art. I'm an advocate for the arts, yes, so I'm going yes. to constantly talk about the arts right. and um, engage in the arts and how you come in. Because, again, a lot of those, uh, you know, extracurricular curricular activities that some of us do, that's our way out. Or we would be in those prisons that you're talking about. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. Well, let, let me say this also. But see, and, and that's one of the things I want to say. It, it's not like a hobby. Right. Like, like for some people, mm -hmm. the arts is who they are. That's right. Like that's their, like their, that's their blessing. And not everybody's got that. And yeah. if they don't, they don't fulfill what their calling is, what their gifts are. They're not quite the person they're supposed to be. We can't deny them that and say, oh, you just want to goof around with some art stuff. No, we have to say, no, that's who you are. And, and, and you could be really great at it. You could yeah. contribute well. In so many ways, we got to, as an education system, we got to meet your needs and your desires and not say, hey, that's just nonsense. Yeah. You should go to college and be an architect. That's not for us to say yeah. that one thing is better than the other. Yeah. So I want to thank you for coming to the show. You, you, uh, this is the third, this is to the show three. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You've been nice. here three times. And so we always ask you a lot of the questions you answer them with no issues. I want you to go ahead. Spark. Did yeah. my question, I had a two part. I don't oh, think it oh, got Yeah. Answered. I didn't get the part two. Yes. Yes. The Chester uh, residents um, regarding the trash burning yeah. for Philly. Do, are there any next steps for that? Well, uh, it depends on who the mayor is, but if I am mayor, I am not sending my trash to pollute some other community. There you, you go. know, that's, that's a, it's as simple as that. <laughs> I wouldn't want them to send their trash to our city to pollute our city. Now, if we are sending our trash being told it's being properly disposed of, okay, that's fine. Mm. But if we now know it's just polluting stuff, we need to stop it. Now, does it make it tough for us? Yeah, it does. We're going to have to find a place where this trash goes, where it's properly disposed of. But my point is you can't just send it somewhere and, and, and let it be, um, you know, uh, 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 adverse to the health and interests of another community. Yeah. yeah, we can't do that. Thank you for answering yeah. that. Is there anything else you want to say to the community before you leave? Um, we, we, you know, Sheryl Parker was able to say her last words. We want to give you, you know, your last words, yeah. you know, your last kind of pitch to the yeah. community. You know, we only do the mayor election once every four years. And whoever gets elected mayor, they're usually there for eight years. Yeah. And so if you look at it this way, if we don't get a change now, you're stuck with what we got for another eight years. And I'm just Gosh, saying, me, me personally, <laughs> I, I am for a thorough change. change. I'm for a whitewashing, scrubbing yes. of this. Uh, the politics is terrible. And, and they're too comfortable. They don't care to respond. You can't get them on the phone. Oh, uh, you know, whatever your complaints are, they don't hear you. They are too entrenched. And I would just say <laughs> this. Please, 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 <laughs> please vote for me and let me clean some house. Power washing. Wow, yeah. yeah. And um, one more question. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What will you do for independent black media? I know oh, you said you that before. But well, yeah. listen, I will do a lot for independent black media and for other independent media because, quite mm -hmm. frankly, and I'll just say this publicly, I find that the, the, the mainstream media, you know, is, is very, very um, unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. There's just too much political consideration. Right. They're all part of the system. You don't get, like, the whole independent thought, the independent research. You don't get a different perspective. You can't, you know, like independent media you're bringing on different people you're exploring different things 
you know, I wish the mainstream media was like, you know, we imagined them back in the days of Walter Cronkite or something. Yeah. But yeah. today, with yeah. so many platforms, so many ways to get your news, yeah. you know, people are not just going with mainstream media anymore. And the future is bright for independent media, like the arts, right? Yeah, that's right. It's bright if we support it. And if independent media is doing such a bang up job, guess what? They're going to bring mainstream media into the same level because right now mainstream media is not holding up their end. You, you heard it. I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, listen, like one of the things I know, right? One of the things that uh, we were excited to see is looking through our analytics and we reach over two million people. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were we were excited about that. And so much so that we try our best to make sure that we're just not talking, but we're we're talking about the solutions. How can we fix things? And every time you come on, that's all you talk about the solutions. Here's the problems. This is how I'm going to fix it. And we appreciate that. Right. I think that that's how the city should move. I think it's a lot of politics. I think it's a lot of politicians being too political and part of that team so right. to speak that's <laughs> i don't know what that team is or the why behind it but i am hopeful that uh we'll have someone that can lead us to where we supposed to be in the city i don't believe that the bad things happen in philly philadelphia as trump said i right. think that it's amazing <laughs> things that's happening here in philadelphia and i'm proud to be a philadelphian um so kudos to you my friend thank um, you yeah, we, we, you know, we, we hope the thank best you, for you. you. We hope you. the best for, you know, the, the right candidate. Um, we don't necessarily endorse anyone. Right. We always say that we're here for whomever is in a, those communities and yes. fighting for the community. Yes. And so that's what we do. And um, you keep fighting a good fight. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, you will have a chance before the eighth to spar, so to speak. If, right, she, right. you know, um, she, I think she could do one, at least one. Right? I think she could put together at least one to talk Listen, to Listen, she's competent, or articulate. Whatever the reason, it's beyond me, yeah. but the time is over, right? Yeah, yeah, we're heading sure. to November 7th. That's right, that's yep. right. And we were the only, one of the only platforms to be able to have both of you guys yes. on, and it was yes. a fight to do, well... It, w it was an interesting time trying to get both candidates on. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he said he's not. <laughs> so without further ado, this your boy Charles Greg with the beautiful. Lawrence. <laughs> and the beautiful. Classy Lady Sparkle. Beautiful. Classy Lady Sparkle. And sir. <laughs> All right. And David O, the beautiful David O. <laughs> yeah. And this is We Talk Weekly, y'all. We out. Peace. All right. <laughs>